them. So we're going to be we're going to be in Numbers chapter 13 this morning. Um, so I'll give you guys I'll give you guys a moment to turn there. Um, Numbers is maybe not a book that you're used to hanging out in. Um, so, but basically, I'll, I'll give you the gist of the gist of the story thus far when we get to Numbers 13. So, so by this point in the story, by this point in the story, God is actually liberated. He's liberated his people um, from Egypt. And he's bringing them out, and he's bringing them through the wilderness, and he's bringing them to the promised land. He's bringing them to a place that will be their own. And this is, this is a place that God has, has promised to bless. It's a place that God has promised that his people will be prosperous in. Um, <clears throat> It's a land that is flowing with milk and honey and, and, and all those good sorts of things. And, and God has brought them uh, safe through the wilderness, out from underneath the hands of the Egyptians. And now at this point in the story, he's bringing them to the edge. He's brought them right to the edge, to, to the precipice, to the, to the boundary of, of Canaan, this promised land that God had for his people. And as, as, as they get there, God instructs Moses to send out a representative from each of the 12 tribal families to go and scout out the land so that they can go ahead and see the things, uh, see the land that God is about to give them. And so, so Moses, uh, Moses get, gathers the, the heads of the different uh, tribes and, and each of them sends a representative to go and scout out the land. And for 40 days, for 40 days, they go into the promised land and they, they go around and they, they see they see the, the fruit that the land is producing. They see the people and the inhabitants that are in the land. Moses wants them to bring back the most detailed report that you could possibly imagine. He wants to know what kinds of fruits are there. He wants to know, is the land good or is it unfruitful? What kind of people are there? Are they big? Are they small? Are they nice people? Are they good people? Or are they bad people? Are they mean people? Bring back all of this information to us so that we can know what God is about to lead us into. And for those of you familiar with the story, you know that, that when the 12 spies come back from the promised land, when the 12 spies come back from the promised land, they give a report to the nation as to what they saw. And what they saw was a land that was flowing with milk and honey. What they saw was a land that was abundant in the fruit that it produced. It, 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 says, it says here in, um, in, in Numbers 13, 23, so when they came to the... Um, when they came to the valley of Eshol, they cut down a branch with a single cluster, a single cluster of grapes, which was carried on a pole by two men. Other translations was grapes as big as your head. Right? This it's probably a cluster of grapes as big as your head, right? It's a big cluster of grapes. And and so it's this land, and it's being described, it's being depicted as full of abundance, full of of, of fruitfulness. But then there's also something else in the land that perhaps God's people had not yet reckoned with. And, and what they report on is that, yes, this land that God is leading us into is flowing with milk and honey. It is fruitful. It is abundant. But the Anakim are there. The, 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 the Amalekites are there. These are descendants of the Nephilim. And these are big and strong men. And we cannot take this land. That's what 10 of the spies say in their report. Two, however, two, however, stand up and say, no, if God has given us this land, then we can take it. If God has given us this land, then we can take it. They say, look, lift up your eyes and see that the protection of those people is gone. We can go in and we can take it. Now, we know the story, the way the story ends up playing out is that the nation of Israel begins listening to the ten spies and not the two. And all of a sudden, after all the things that God has done for his people, he has single-handedly liberated them from the nation of Egypt, brought them out with a tremendous amount of wealth, brought them through the wilderness, led them by a pillar of cloud by day, by a pillar of fire at night. He has, he has rained down manna from heaven every evening, a flock of quail 
quail would come and settle on the camp and they would, they would pick up meat to eat. He provided water from a rock. He had done all these things. And when he brings them to the edge of the land, these ten spies come back with this negative report. Well, it's not really all negative, but it's, it's this, this report. And they try and persuade the people, don't go in. It's going to be too difficult. These people are too big, too bad, and we will not be able to go there. We will not be able to do it. And those ten spies, those ten people who came and gave a report, ended up swaying the entire nation so that they turned their hearts against the Lord. So that they turned their hearts against the Lord and they refused to enter into the very thing that God had promised for them to enter into. This ended up resulting in the nation wandering around in the wilderness for another 40 years until that generation died out and the next generation was able to enter in and to lay hold of the things that God had for his people. Two, however, Caleb and Joshua were able to go in without the rest of the nation. Them and their families were allowed to go in and settle in the promised land ahead of time. Because they knew and understood something. They knew and they understood that if God has promised to give it to them, if God has spoken, then He will give them the ability to lay hold of the things that He has promised. Now why? Why is it that only two went in? Why is it that only two went in? Was it because the land was inherently bad? No, not at all. The other ten spies, as I said before, the other ten spies were clearly able to see that this land was good. Flowing with milk and honey. Fruit as big as your head. Everything you could want. It's this beautiful, beautiful land. The only problem was, is they were going to have to fight for it. It wasn't just going to be the manna raining from heaven every morning on the, in, in, in the morning on the, on, on the grass. It wasn't just going to be the flock of quail that, that, that came to their camp every night. <clears throat> they were going to have to move into that land and dispossess the inhabitants, and they were going to have to fight. <clears throat> now, why, why, why do I bring this up? Why do, I, why, why, do we, why do we talk about something like this? The reason why we're talking about this this morning is because I believe, I believe that the church in the world today is standing on the precipice of something new, of something great. God is up to something. God is up to something in this, in this time and in this season. <clears throat> It's very clear to me that he's, he's, he's taken this entire last six, seven months to begin to disrupt the normal patterns of the church's life. To disrupt and to, to, to begin to break apart the normal patterns and the normal ways of thinking that we think about church. I said when this whole thing kicked off that during this season God was going to reveal to you the state of your heart. That God was going to show you things that were buried down deep that you had perhaps covered up that you didn't quite realize were there. Attitudes, prejudices, uh, hardness, bitterness, whatever it was that was there and God is going to reveal it in this season and for many of you I know that he has that this has been an incredibly difficult season as you've had nothing to do but sit at home and let all those, you, you've been unable to, to drown out the, no, the noise of your heart with the busyness of life because of this season. God has been doing that. I, I, I said that in this season, God was going to be arranging things and, and applying pressure, just like, a, just like a, a, a masseuse comes in and applies pressure to a knot until it releases so that it can come back into alignment, that God has been applying pressure to his church so that they will release the things that aren't like the way that they're supposed to be. And now I believe that we are actually on, on the precipice of, of this thing that God is promising for us, that this, this promised land on the precipice of the promises of God to live in the fullness of His kingdom. To live in the fullness of His kingdom. And so, many of you, many of you right now are standing on the riverbank. 
And God has promised to you, God has promised you things. He's brought you words of, words of prophecy. He's spoken things to your heart when you've spent time alone with Him in prayer. And, and you've, you've held on to those things. And you've held on to them and you've held on to them and you've held on to them. Wondering when will this come to pass. And I believe, I believe God is inviting you now in this season in this next season, to actually lay hold of those promises, to begin to fight for those things in ways that you have never fought for them before, to pursue Him for the fulfillment of His promises in ways that you've never pursued Him before. God is absolutely up to something in His church. And so, so where, where are we right now? Where are we right now? What, what is happening in the church? My honest belief is that God's desire is to raise up his church and to bless his church in tremendous ways. Now, when people hear that, when people hear that, they think, okay, the gold, the jewels, the, the fanciness, and the, you know, the Bentley, all this sort of stuff. No, I don't, I don't believe that at all. I think, I think what God is wanting is to raise up his church in holiness and righteousness and a real, true demonstration of his goodness and his glory and his grace. He wants to bless his church with purity and righteousness so that when, when the church goes out into the world, they can see the goodness and glory of God on our faces. God wants us to bring us into that place. But the issue is, is there's so many things that hold us back. There's so many things that are hindering us from stepping into the fullness of what God would have for us be, have us to be as his church. Things like religiosity. Things like religiosity. Making sure that we play everything by the rule book because it's not possible for God to do anything outside his rule book before we're willing to love people. When somebody comes into your church, you want their, you want their statement of, you want their confession of, of belief before you're willing to shake their hand and to genuinely love them like a fellow human being. To give them all the love, all the love that God has given you when it says in Romans 5 that he loved you while you were still a sinner. He wants to do that. Religiosity stops us from loving in that way. Things like buildings and status. We are very good, especially in the West, giving the, the long traditions of Christianity in the West. We're very good at building monuments and edifices to the church. And, and those things aren't always bad. We're meeting in a lovely building right now. And we love the fact that God has given us this building. But what can often happen, what can often happen is that we then begin to get afraid of losing those monuments and those edifices. And it begins to affect the way in which we make decisions about how we are going to live and act and move as a church. So then all of a sudden things become about, well, we've got to do this. We've got to make sure we're getting enough money coming in the offering so that we could pay the mortgage. And we want to pay the mortgage, okay? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying that that is important. But, but when we begin to allow a building or status to take its place of priority in our hearts over and against the prioritizing of His presence and living as his disciples, then things get skewed and it begins to hold us back. We're unable to actually live the way that God would have us live. Things like wealth. Wealth provides pleasures and provides comforts. And there's nothing wrong with wealth, but, but Jesus, says, Jesus says in the parable of the sower that wealth is deceptive. Wealth will say to you, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Wealth will say to you, I can give you life, you can buy it. I can give you happiness, you can buy it. Wealth will, will attempt to deceive you and say that it is the thing, it is your security, when it is not truly secure. And so many Christians, so many Christians, so easily get caught up in the trap of wealth and providing for themselves. And it holds us back. Political influence. Political influence. We want to control the culture. 
and we want to use the world's means of doing it. Rather than, rather than genuinely being the most stellar example of Christ-like love that we could possibly be, the love that topples empires, we, 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 we campaign and we lobby to, to, to make changes in government policy. And that's not necessarily wrong in and of itself. But so many Christians I see get so angry and so upset when a politician doesn't listen to them. God wants to relieve us of all these burdens. God wants us to lay them aside. God wants us to enter into that place where we can carry His presence, where we can step in to the things that He has promised. And to do that, we need to lay aside some of those things. He wants to bring us into a place of true prosperity, which means true righteousness, abundance of joy, peace, satisfaction. He wants to bring us to a place where we have the resource to do anything that He leads us to do. He wants to bring us to a place where, where we live and the world around us and our sphere of influence flourishes and thrives as it can only flourish and thrive in His kingdom. He wants to bring us to a place of true power. Not power through the world system, but power straight from the throne room of God. Power to heal. Power to bind up broken hearts. Power to destroy the works of darkness. Those works of darkness can only be destroyed by the power of God's love. People can only be mended and healed by the power of His love. Sure, you can have all sorts of programs. You can have all sorts of of, of care agencies and all these sorts of things that they can, they can put band-aids over things. They can do all sorts of really good things, but, but those situations don't get fixed and don't get healed and don't get resolved apart from the very healing and resolution that comes from the kingdom of God and the power of God. And I believe that God is warning us as His people to step into that. So because God has brought the church to this place, He's brought the church to this place of, of disruption. He's, he's exposed a lot of our edifices for, for the, the weak and frivolous things that they are. You know, we, 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 we talk about like as in, well, you need, to have, you need to have the Sunday service in this particular way, or you need to have the music in this way. When everyone was forced to actually go and do church online, well, it actually revealed that, well, church church doesn't have to be done in a building like this and exactly like this and and worship worship let's be honest is very poorly done when it's when it's broadcast via zoom um man zoom church i okay show of hands who loved zoom church i mean apart apart from you getting to just stay at home who loved zoom church because, I mean, most of the time I was on this side of the camera, so I was enjoying it. But man, there, there was like one or two times when I had to tune in via Zoom. And, you know, the preaching, was, but the worship, it, it's just like it's on a tablet, it's small. Zoom won't let you connect to a Bluetooth speaker while casting. I mean, okay. Uh, sounds like I should put a support ticket in rather than just put this on you guys. But, but what it revealed, what it revealed is that is that the church has a much greater need for community that we had kind of just taken for granted. The church is far more fluid than just these four walls. The body of Christ extends, it's not just the people in this room, it's not just Grace House, like the body of Christ is every single church across this city and across this nation. And it's not even the buildings, it is the people. And I believe that God is bringing His people to a greater sense of unity, a greater sense of 
cross-pollinization, where, where maybe it won't be a, a, as weird or, or awkward to just go and visit other churches and to fellowship with other groups. And, 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 and we, so, we will no longer be about building our church in our location, but we'll be concerned about building the church and building His kingdom and working in His kingdom wherever the Spirit leads. So in order, in order for God to do the things that He wants to do in His church, He's had to reorientate us around Himself again. There's so many distractions in the way that we've done church, in our lives, personal. We've become weighed down and burdened by worldly practices. And, I, and when I say that, I don't necessarily mean just like sinful things. But just things like cultures and attitudes that are brought in from the world. You know, measuring the success, the success of your church via KPIs. How many visitors did you have on a Sunday? What's your visitor retention rate? How many, how many conversions and baptisms did you have? Statistically, how did that compare to this month last year? How can you, how, you know, like, if, if there's, there's this whole industry built around church growth. I think God's doing away with it. What God's desire is to bring us into this next season is to reorientate the entirety of the church back to himself. To reorientate the church back to himself. You see, <clears throat> it's the nature of, of gravity that, that it has this pull and, 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 and it bends the space around it. And so, and so whatever, whatever it is you give the greatest amount of space to in your life will be the thing that bends your life around it. It will, it will begin to pull all other areas of your life into orbit around that thing. It's what it's like in our solar system. We, we, you know, um, we have a moon and because it's closest to us, it orbits around the earth. If it was closer to Jupiter, Jupiter would pick it up and it would orbit around Jupiter. It's the same thing with our lives. We can, we can have God within our solar system and not be orbiting around God. You can have God in your life, but really your job is your priority. Your your economic success, your career is your priority. And, and because you orbit around that, everything else is bent to that. Maybe it's your hobby. Maybe it's your hobby. It's the thing you just love doing. And because that's the main thing you love doing, it's, you know, it's the thing you live for, everything else begins to bend around that. Maybe it's a, 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 a loved one. Maybe it's your husband, or your wife, or your girlfriend, or your boyfriend, or whatever, whatever it is. And, and all of a sudden, your world revolves around that person, and everything else gets bent to facilitate the center of your universe. And what I believe God is doing is He is reorientating His church. He's reprioritizing the very heart of His church to be in, around Him once again, to be around His presence once again, to the exclusion of everything else. Everything else needs to be brought into orbit around Him. <clears throat> several months ago now, several months ago now, I had a dream. And um, Tina's outed me last week as somebody who has dreams. And so... <laughs> Call me a dream funnel. <laughs> yep. So I spent the week repenting of my bitterness in my heart because he called me a dream funnel. Um, <laughs> but what will often happen is, is I, will, I will spend an, the entire night dreaming about a certain thing or a certain topic, and it will be a whole series of dreams. And at the end of the night, I, I, will, I won't remember any of them, but God will give me this, this summary of the content of all the dreams. And the summary of this content was, was the picture of, this, of the church. And this slice came down the middle of the church. And then I heard the word cleave. And I've been praying on that and meditating on that for a couple months now as to what that could mean. And to what that could be. 
And because I'm, I'm naturally more pessimistic than anything, <clears throat> I hear cleave, I think cleaver. The church is going to be cleaved in two. As I prayed upon it, pray, prayed, prayed about it, the Lord, who's far more optimistic than me, um, praise God he is, um, <laughs> began to reveal to me that there's actually a dual meaning to this. I do believe that there is a separation and a division coming into the church in the next little while. I believe there is. And where this division is going to take place is going to be between those who are cleaving to Christ, who are cleaving to Him intimately, who are cleaving to Him in such a way that everything about their life is about serving Him and following Him and being discipled by Him and following His voice wherever it goes, whatever it asks you to do, wherever it takes you, whatever the new form of church looks like, whether it's here or it's in a home or it's in a cathedral or wherever it is, there's going to be a portion of the church. There's going to be a portion of the church, and I hope it's a very large portion of the church that is going to be enamored and in love with the Lord Jesus Christ in a way that they have never been in love with the Lord Jesus Christ before and that is going to cause a separation between them and the people who are just content and zealous for the traditions of their fathers traditions of their forebears their content and 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 their desire is to maintain the system as it has been, because that's the way that it's always been, at, at least for the last 150 years. And so I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you in this moment to cleave to Christ, to begin in your life, to begin to prayerfully examine everything about your life and to begin to bend it and conform it so that all of it comes and begins to orbit around God and His presence and, and spending time with Him. I, I truly believe, I truly believe, truly believe we, we are standing at a tipping point for something amazing that God is doing in his church. And if you want to see what God is doing in his church, you need to prioritize him. You need to prioritize his presence. Because if you don't, you won't be able to see what it is that God's doing. Everyone thinks that when God shows up, it's going to be so obvious. That, oh, we'll know it when we see it. But that's not, that's not always true. You know, we keep talking about revival. And, and I genuinely hope that God, I still believe that God is going to pour out His Spirit in, in revival like, is it, like in the days of old. Where His presence is just so tangible and palpable. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. When Jesus walked the earth and He entered Jerusalem... There's that passage in Matthew, Matthew 23 and the passage in Luke 19 where he says, where he stands and he weeps over Jerusalem. He weeps over Jerusalem because he longed to gather them, but they weren't having it. They would not be gathered by him. And in Luke 19 it says, and destruction came upon, and destruction will come upon this city. Why? Because they missed the day that God visited them. They were expecting a guy to show up on a war horse with a sword waving around and liberate them from the Romans. And unless, they, unless the Messiah was going to show up like that, they didn't want it. And I think that God is going to turn up for His church. And He's going to do something in the church in this next season. And it's not going to be flashy. It's not going to be perhaps overly exciting from the outside. It may seem downright ordinary. But it's going to be a move of God unlike the world has ever seen. 
And if you don't have the eyes to see, if you have not been carefully tuning your ear to hear His voice, you won't hear it and you won't see it. And so my encouragement to you, my encouragement to you, is that God has a tremendous amount of blessing and a tremendous amount of love and goodness that He wants to pour out on His church. And, and, and hear me, even for those, even for those who, who, who miss it, God has no less love for those people. God loves them just as much. You, you, think, you think Jesus didn't love His people when he, when he stood and wept over Jerusalem? But God is doing something here and now. And so, my hope and my prayer for you is that you would look and see the promised land. You would see all the things that God has promised for His people. The, not only corporately, but also individually. And you wouldn't be afraid of the things that, that look intimidating. You'd no longer be put off by just how impossible things might look. But that instead, you would pursue Him and you'd begin to fight for the things that God has given. And to begin to reorientate your whole life around His presence, around your time of prayer, around worshiping, not only in the secret place, but with other believers to encourage one another. And when we do that, I believe we are going to see God move in mighty and spectacular ways.